Understanding how genomic variation between sagebrush plants impacts what will happen in real landscapes is a crucial aspect of the whole GEM3 project. When we look at this project, we have three levels of data that range from greenhouse data to a real landscape. The greenhouse data is really powerful because it lets us look at how different types of plants respond to heat and stress in a very controlled environment. Our team, what we are trying to see is, can sagebrush populations adapt to a rapid change in the environment? To really be able to understand how this plant will respond to different treatments. To do that, you have to clone them, but we are not doing we are not doing any genetically or we are not doing any GMOs or any modifications. We are just taking advantage of nature and we propagate from the same individual, we create what we call a line, a clonal line. And it starts from <laughs> this box here where we grow them on jelly bean. Um, we provide them all the sugar and everything so that they can start growing from a, a meristem, a bud, right? They grow. And then we have from the same individual, we have a lot of them. And then these can be used as replicates to then conduct an experiment. And we can compare when you fix the genome, they will have the same genome. How do they respond to the different environments? And you not only do that for one individual, you're going to be doing this for a multitude of individuals. And these individuals are from different places in the landscape. My research is unique in the fact that I am developing the methods that are needed to actually propagate sagebrush in order to make enough biomass for genome sequencing. And in addition to that, we're developing all of the protocols to move those sagebrush seedlings into uh, the greenhouse and be able to actually do genome to phenome uh, research on those. We do everything from top to bottom. So I'm not just looking at one thing. I'm not just looking at one plant and the way it looks. I'm not just looking at maybe one bacterium in a petri dish. I'm helping make all of these plants grow. We're extracting all of the DNA, going through the experiments, and then doing all the computer work as well. Uh, so I think it's really unique that I get to be part of this whole vertically integrated process, which I don't, I don't think I've seen in other programs. This research specifically is funded by GEM3, uh, the National Science Foundation, through EBSCO. We have Boise State University funding this research through my um, seed uh, grant, and then uh, another grant has contributed to some of the ideas um, about drought tolerance, and that comes from Lush, uh, a cosmetic company. To be able to understand how important this genetic variation between plants is in a real landscape, we need to be able to go somewhere out, in the real world, and see how plants are responding to climate conditions. So the Castle Rock site is an ideal opportunity to explore how plants are growing, surviving, and reproducing in a real landscape. We are investigating here a transitional zone from high elevation to lower elevation. In higher elevation it's moist, in the lower it's dry. And um, this is a very special place because here are multiple um, influences at the state park. We have the Snake River Plain in the north, um, the Rocky Mountains in the east, and the Great Basin in the west. And where such zones meet, um, we call those places ecotones. This is where um, two or more ecosystems coincide with all their traits. And we make use of this because we have in our higher elevation, um, we have a mountain big sagebrush, and this is bound to the moisture. In the lower elevation, we have Wyoming big sagebrush and Basin big sagebrush. They can cope with different soil types and moisture, and especially drought, actually. So I have a background in remote sensing and unmanned aircraft systems. And using some very specialized sensors, we're using a multispectral and hyperspectral, LIDAR and thermal sensors to fly over sagebrush patches that the uh, other members of the team are collecting samples from. Uh, what we're actually doing out here is really cutting edge research. So by applying these advanced sensors, uh, this hyperspectral remote sensing, thermal analysis, 
we're starting to identify different characteristics from plants that might be even side by side. So being able to identify these characteristics at this spatial scale that is so uh, fine scale is really an interesting and um, kind of revolutionary uh, approach in science. And then looking at taking that and looking at the spatial distribution across the landscape and being able to map out these patterns, uh, it's going to be something that is going to be very useful for answering a lot of the questions that we have in GEM3 and contributing to uh, sagebrush conservation and long-term management goals. So the SARE program stands for Summer Authentic Research Experience, and it gives undergraduate students a chance to take part um, in the entire research process, um, and especially for students who like haven't participated in research before, um, it's an excellent opportunity to get involved um, with the entire research process. What has been really incredible for me is to see how these PhD students have formulated these questions, how their kind of life and educational history has led to this moment and how they work with one another to find solutions to problems that arise, you know, in the uncontrollable nature of a natural laboratory. Um, and yeah, how they work with one another and work within their own research. The most interesting thing about this research at this site is that we have brought all of these different teams to come together. So my research looking at the microbes and the arthropods can be tied to our modeling team and our mechanisms team and our modeling team. So we're really bringing all of these core groups together to understand what is happening on this landscape, which is this really great hybrid zone that provides us this natural place to answer some really cool questions. And moving on from Castle Rocks, our ultimate goal is to be able to apply the insights we've learned about different types of sagebrush plants to managing real landscapes. One of the biggest disturbances that sagebrush plant faces is fire, and how sagebrush plants recover from fire will ultimately be very important for grazing, for predicting impacts on rural economies, and for the hundreds of plant and animal species that depend on sagebrush. And so the Soda Garden is our test site to apply the insights that we learned from our living laboratory in Castle Rock and our greenhouse experiments to see how well we can predict how sagebrush plants are recovering after a megafire. So this site is the Soda Fire site. It burned in the summer of 2015 about 300,000 acres with a fire that was large enough to be seen from Boise. And so these massive wildfires are increasing in frequency and size across our region. It is being right, right behind me, this is the edge of the fire that happened in 2015. And we're actually looking how the natural population is coming back out from the edge into the burned area. So we we're using drone technology to monitor how uh, young recruits establish in the disturbed area and uh, what is the fate of those recruits. We, we count the individuals, we come back next year, and with that information we can forecast what the population may look like five or ten years from now. In order for sagebrush to be restored um, after things like fire, we need to understand which genotypes and which sagebrush are actually going to persist and be able to restore the habitat. And the thing that helps us kind of understand that is going to be our common gardens. And common gardens, um, especially out here in the landscape, really give us those key ideas of what genotype is going to persist on the land and what we can be planting. Well, my work happens a little bit more face-to-face -face with other people. So I work closely with the stakeholder advisory groups that we have set up in two regions of the state, in the Tetons um, out east, as well as the Owyhees. So those two stakeholder uh, groups were established because those are both communities that are closely tied to the landscape through uh, ranching, through recreation, um, and through other kind of both just economic and uh, cultural um, connections. And looking at all those things um, and then combining data from the ecological sides of the project and as well as some um, past history of management. So how were these landscapes managed before um, versus how they're being managed today to help better understand um, why people have the attitudes that they do about 
managing these landscapes and making decisions for these landscapes and for the communities so tied to these landscapes. And um, using that to better understand how um, those attitudes might change in the future. One of my favorite stories about sagebrush is that um, it has a, each species has a chemical dialect and they talk to one another. And so they tell each other about stressors like herbivores feeding on them or stressors like drought. And the ones that are more closely related to one another hear that message better and they respond better. And so part of what our team does is try to understand how the genes interact with the environment that result in a message that allows these plants to communicate with one another, but also communicate with the other dancers in this relationship. And those other players, the other dance, dance partners is sage grouse and pygmy rabbits and pronghorn. So we're interested in understanding how these two herbivores and plants interact in a changing environment. And we do that partially through chemistry, which is why we need engineers who you might have met um, that build sensors and geoscientists that put them on the bottom of drones. And we have lab-based um, approaches so that we can hear and see and smell uh, what sagebrush is trying to say to the world.